a lot, Karen, for this very kind uh, and generous introduction. So uh, I'd like to thank the Department of Laboratory Medicine at the University of Washington for the invitation for us to present at Grand Rounds today. Um, I will uh, warn the audience that I tend to speak quite fast. Uh, I'm working on slowing down a little bit, but it's very hard for me. So if you notice that my speed kind of is a little bit out of control, just gesture or something <laughs> politely. Um, so, uh, so as Karen mentioned, I'm a, a physician a scientist at the Research Institute and a clinical and molecular geneticist at the Seattle Children's uh, Hospital at, at Seattle Children's. And over the past four years that I've been here in Seattle, I've been increasingly working with the Department of Laboratory Medicine, both at the University of Washington and at Seattle Children's, to offer and develop next generation sequencing for pediatric disorders. And one of the really great things that has occurred during this process is the ability to translate some of the research genetic findings and discovery, discoveries into the uh, uh, clinical molecular and diagnostic arena. And what I'd, I'd like to share kind of this journey with you very quickly. Um, and I would like to highlight uh, an important paradigm that's emerging for pediatric genetic diagnostic uh, uh, efforts. And this is a paradigm that has existed for decades in the cancer world and for labs offering uh, cancer diagnostic testing. But in, the, in, in clinical labs offering clinical molecular genetic uh, uh, diagnostic tests, this is a really emerging paradigm that is not only upon our lab, but is upon all the labs nationally and uh, internationally. So there will be four main themes uh, and points that I, that I highlight in my uh, talk. The first is the use and the yield for next generation sequencing for developmental pediatric disorders and brain disorders in particular. Second, I'm going to focus on a specific group of disorders, which are brain overgrowth disorders, or megalencephaly, that Karen mentioned, um, and their genetic causes within a very interesting uh, uh, pathway or network. Third, I'll transition to talk about our panel, the panel that we offer jointly through the University of Washington Department of Laboratory Medicine and Seattle Children's, which is the megalencephaly panel, or the megaplex. This is not, by the way, the only panel. As you probably all know, we have several other next generation sequencing panels that uh, many of us work on, including epiplex and immunoplex, but I'm going to focus in on me um, the megaplex. And then finally, I'll end with just highlighting some of the future avenues and directions. Where do we go from here? What's the future for molecular diagnostic work, and importantly, therapeutic avenues. And there's a really exciting clinical translational component to all of this that I will highlight as well. So if we were to take a step back at the beginning and just b briefly look at the landscape of genetic diagnostic testing for uh, constitutional disorders in pediatrics, we've really come a long way. So our diagnostic labs have gone from relying primarily on cytogenetic techniques, such as karyotyping, fish arrays later uh, or a few years uh, down the line, into much more advanced genetic testing. So fast forward to 2016, clinical NGS is available widely now not only in the form of targeted panels, but also exome sequencing and genome sequencing. And not only is it used for developmental uh, pediatric disorders, as uh, most of you know, but it's heavily used as well for understanding the genetic causes of cancer, complex disorders, and answering more fundamental questions about genetics, such as population genetics and evolutionary genetics, for example. Now, um, the goal with clinical NGS, as with any diagnostic test, is ultimately the diagnosis, the early diagnosis of a disorder, prevention of early manifestations, and ultimately initiation of appropriate and early treatment for these disorders. So clinical NGS is no different than any other diagnostic test in that sense, but it's technically much more challenging. So clinical labs offering NGS services have rapidly transitioned from offering targeted panels of one or a few genes that are very disease specific to much more global assays, such as whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing. Now, with these broader applications, the most ideal experimental and testing paradigm or design would be what's called a trio-based approach, which is shown here, whereby a child's genomic DNA is simultaneously sequenced and analyzed with the parental DNA to help filter out genetic variation and ultimately identify the pathogenic mutation or mutations that are causative of the child's disorder if, if they're present. And so this has been now, the clinical NGS services are now widely available. And as commercially, the sequencing platforms and capture technologies and the analysis pipelines are continuously optimized, uh, 
The medical field is left to deal with a very important challenge, which is highlighted over here, which is variant interpretation. And variant interpretation is a problem that cl clinical diagnostic labs have struggled with for decades, prior to next, the era of next generation sequencing, even in the Sanger sequencing era. And this, multiple, this, this problem actually has multiple factors that help address and improve our ability to perform adequate variant interpretation, which is, of course, data sharing of pathogenic and normal variation across diagnostic labs. The availability of public databases, sorry, I'm looking for my pointer here, which I can't see. The availability of public databases of normal genetic variation, and these are becoming more widely available. And then, um, and then um, uh, the, the availability of robust and standard functional assays that help with the interrogation of these variation. So in, uh, as, of course, needless to say, next generation sequencing rapidly accelerated gene discovery. But there are two fields in particular where next generation sequencing has been especially revolutionary. And these are the field, the first field is the field of rare diseases. Or, and a lot of these are, of course, neurological diseases, such as autism, intellectual disability, epilepsy, brain malformations, movement disorders. Because for a lot of these, prior to NGS, the main challenge towards gene discovery was ascertaining enough children with that disorder. And these individual phenotypes were, were rare. Collectively, they're common, but individually, they were very rare. And as we all know, NGS has proven to be a very powerful tool for gene discovery in small disease cohorts and even in individuals as well. The second area that has been exceptionally benefited from uh, NGS has been mosaic developmental disorders, such as overgrowth disorders, vascular malformations, because of the fact that the main challenge with these disorders is that the level of the mutation or the level of mosaicism can be quite low, depending on the fraction of cells that have that mutation. And therefore, the uh, standard molecular techniques prior to NGS were often inadequate and of low sensitivity and resolution to detect these mosaic variants. And the group of disorders that I'm going to talk about today actually straddle the fence between these two groups. I'm going to talk about brain overgrowth or megalencephaly, which is a developmental brain disorder that is associated with mosaicism. And before I dive into that, I want to share with you very quickly that for somebody studying brain disorders in children, there was another revolution that we witnessed prior to NGS that was equally important, which is modern neuroimaging. Because in the 80s, we relied primarily, for example, on CT scans to determine, which are, of course, have very, a very poor resolution to determine the structure of the brain. So our ability to uh, characterize uh, brain malformations and classify them was limited to the most severe disorders, such as, for example, a smooth brain like lysencephaly shown here, more severe forms of cortical dysplasia and cortical malformations and heterotopia. Fast forward again with modern neuroimaging, and we have wonderful uh, neuroimaging. Uh, 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 the quality of neuroimaging at Seattle Children's, of course, is fantastic. Our ability to morphologically characterize these malformations has improved dramatically. And our classification has become increasingly complex. So we now know of many, many brain malformations. And we can diagnose them on imaging quite early in a child's life. So we're really at a, in a very, very ideal uh, uh, point in time where we have both tools, NGS and modern neuroimaging, that both that allow us to very efficiently and accurately diagnose children, both on the clinical side and on the molecular side. So the number, when we talk about neurodevelopmental disorders and gene discovery for neurodevelopmental disorders, the number of genes has just increased dramatically. And this was not only, by the way, facilitated by NGS, but also by several other things, like the maturation of copy number studies and the rapid identification of genetic causes associated with epilepsy, autism, and intellectual disability. And here's an example of this. This is an authoritative uh, review that takes place every few years by leaders in the field, like Drs. Jim Barkovich, Renzo Guarini, uh, Ruben Kuzniecki, and uh, Bill Dobbins. And in 2005, prior to NGS being widely clinically available, the number of uh, genes associated with brain malformations was only 27. In 2012, it was more than 100. And of course, this list is now horribly outdated. This number is outdated significantly. Four years later, we have hundreds of genetic associations, all harnessed by the availability of clinical next generation sequencing. And this really has been revolutionary for the field uh, as a whole, because previously, the way we would classify brain malformations is, was uh, primarily uh, based on the developmental stage. We would look at the developmental stage in neuronal development at which we believe that the development has gone astray, and we classify the malformation accordingly. But the rapid era of gene discovery has allowed us to identify that many of these genes are functionally and genetically related in intricate pathways. 
And this has allowed us to shift our way of thinking from a developmental-based classification scheme into pathway-based developmental schemes. And this is really, really important because many of these pathways are targetable by molecular therapies. And so this really puts us in a much uh, uh, ideal position to think about therapies for these, uh, for these disorders. And the group of disorders I'm going to talk about highlight this, I think, better than, any other, better than many other disorders. So what about next generation sequencing and mosaicism? Can we accurately and reliably det detect mosaic disorders using NGS? We have the tools. We have the tools this day and age to do this. Now, when we step back as well, quickly, um, and uh, think about mosaic disorders, the classic teaching about mosaic disorders is that they're classified perhaps into three basic groups, mosaic manifestations of Mendelian diseases, such as tuberous sclerosis is a, is a great example. A group of disorders that are believed to be obligatory mosaic, meaning that if they were germline or constitutional, they would be lethal. And I'll, I'll talk about those uh, uh, in a bit. And then, of course, the group of disorders that are known to be germline or gonadal mosaic, such as many forms of skeletal dysplasia, OI being a great example. But we all know that mosaicism is a spectrum. It is dependent upon the fraction of cells within an organism that harbors any given mutation. So it really is a continuous spectrum. And this classification may be somewhat arbitrary. In the late, uh, I mean, decades ago, in the late 70s and 80s, I believe, one of the leaders in the field of mosaicism, Rudy Hoppel, hypothesized that there are several disorders that, based on their visible physical characteristics, are mosaic. And they are caused by mutations in genes that, if they were constitutional, they would be lethal. And lo and behold, it was only NGS that actually proved his hypotheses to be correct. And in 2012, it started actually with the identification of mosaic AKT1 mutations in Proteus syndrome. This was followed very quickly by many new genes, including KRAS and HRAS uh, uh, mutations in Nevis sebaceous syndrome or uh, schimmel penning syndrome, followed by the identification of G mosaic GNAQ mutations in Sturge-Weber syndrome, and then, of course, uh, NRAS mutations in neurocutaneous melanosis. And these are just a few of these disorders. But again, this flurry of gene discovery for these mosaic disorders occurred after NGS became widely available. So it was truly revolutionary, and it proved Rudy's hypothesis that had occurred decades prior to that. Now, many of these genes converge on an important signaling network, which is the PI3K AKT mTOR network. This is a very critical pathway that has important roles in cellular proliferation, differentiation, growth, vasculogenesis, tumorogenesis, and brain development. And our group, among other, many other groups uh, across the country and the world, have identified mutations within various elements that are shown in blue within these pathways, within these key genes, in developmental pediatric disorders. Not cancer, but de developmental pediatric disorders. These mutations have certain themes. If you, if you take a global look, they have certain themes that emerge. First is that many of these mutations are found somatically in tumors. Typically, there is no familial recurrence for these phenotypes, with exceptions that I'll mention in a second. They have been seen in monozygotic, discordant monozygotic twins, which is consistent with uh, or supportive of mosaicism. They have a growth-promoting effect, which fits with the fact with, or with the hypothesis that if they were constitutional or germline, they would be lethal. There are exceptions. And they're characterized by segmental or patchy manifestations. And also there are exceptions. And you may recognize some of them. Of course, the infamous TSC1 and TSC2 genes are right here. And P10, of course, is a very well-known gene, both in the cancer and pediatric constitutional world as well. I won't delve into all the phenotypes and the genes within this pathway, but I, will, I would like to mention briefly two specific genes and examples that I think are really uh, relevant and help uh, exemplify some of the, the core principles. The first is the gene PIK3CA, which is located upstream within the pathway. So PIK3CA is a gene that is part of the PI3K enzymatic complex, shown over here, which is downstream of receptor tyrosine kinase. It's a master regulator of AKT, the AKT complex. And the a AKT complex itself is the master central regulator of the pathway. It phosphorylates multiple downstream targets, activating or inhibiting them in turn. Mosaic mutations of PIK3CA have been identified in a spectrum of disorders in children that include both body and brain involvement. And the, the variability is just staggering. So the body involvement ranges. Typically, the most common themes, by the way, are overgrowth with vascular malformations. And the body involvement ranges widely from very severe, diffuse 
body overgrowth with vascular malformations to more generalized and symmetric malformations. And I'll talk about this disorder in detail in a second. Two, very focal involvement involving one extremity, such as classical clipal trinani, what's been classically called clipal trinani syndrome, shown in, that, in this image, to even more focal forms, such as overgrowth of one finger or a few fingers, for example, and even focal lipomatosis. And more recently, over the past a few months, it's been identified, mutations have been identified in isolated lymphatic malformations, which are quite common, and isolated vascular malformations, which are also quite common in the pediatric population. The brain spectrum is equally wide, meaning that the range of involvement goes anywhere from diffuse brain overgrowth, shown in red over here, where the entire brain is really big and very dysplastic, to more focal forms. So when one half of the brain is involved, this has been called hemimegalencephaly, which is, of course, a famous condition among uh, neurologists, pediatric neurologists, has a very high seizure uh, incidence, often intractable. Many of these children require resection of that hemisphere of the brain. And even more focal forms, such of, of brain dysplasia, which are highlighted in red over here, where as only a small part of the, fo uh, of, of the cortex is abnormal and dysplastic. Yet, that focus is incredibly epileptogenic. So focal cortical dysplasia, which is shown on the uh, uh, side here in these two uh, images, is actually the most common cause of focal intractable epilepsy in children. It's one of the most common reasons for referral to pediatric surgery, and many of these children undergo resection, which is often associated with a really high morbidity and mortality. And many of these children have post-operative seizure recurrence. So our surgical methods are not as efficient and as effective as we'd like them to be. So the question could be, could we use molecular methods? Could we use molecular therapies? That is uh, the question that we are uh, currently uh, contemplating. So that's pic 3 ca The second gene I just want to exemplify is a gene downstream within the pathway, which is mTOR, shown in blue over here. Mutations of mTOR itself have just over the past year been identified to be associated also with a spectrum of disorders, including diffuse brain overgrowth, focal cortical dysplasia, shown in red over here, and then mosaic patchy skin manifestations. And I apologize if the resolution is not that clear, but there are some linear hyperpigmented streaks that resemble hypomelanosis of E2. For those of you who also have seen kids with uh, genetic conditions and, and neurologic, uh, neurology uh, clinic uh, patients, uh, this has uh, actually been well described. And uh, so it's an equally broad spectrum with mTOR mutations. And again, if we step back again, back to the pathway, similar phenotypes have been seen across many other genetic components within the pathway. Now, you may recognize again, as I mentioned, P10. So P10 is actually has been identified, of course, for decades to be associated with cancer, but also with developmental pediatric disorders. The mechanism of disease in P10, just very quickly, is actually different than PIC3CA and mTOR. Loss of function of P10, rather than gain of function, are typically associated with disorders. And the disorders are usually, uh, uh, there's a spectrum. They're called the P10-related hamartoma tumor syndrome, which includes Cowden syndrome, which is characterized by body overgrowth with mucosal papillomas. It's also a cancer predisposition syndrome, for, such as, for example, cerebellar uh, uh, tumors. Um, and importantly, mutations of, of P10 are probably among the most common single gene causes of autism, in large autism series, especially with, in the presence of brain overgrowth in those children. So here's actually a study that was produced by Evan Eichler's lab, that, uh, whereby they performed a large screen of their autism cohort, and they identified mutations of P10 in a large number of cases. Uh, most of the P10 mutations that have been reported have been constitutional, not mosaic. But when you look at the literature, there have been many case reports that are scattered that show uh, focal segmental manifestations of P10 that resemble PIK3CA, that resemble mTOR. And whether or not there's a mosaic second hit in these cases is, remains to be known because most of these cases were published prior to NGS. So again, this essentially what I'd like to, to uh, uh, exemplify through these genes is that there's a spectrum of phenotypes that is associated with the PI3K AKT mTOR pathway. And these disorders really show or highlight an important link between cancer disorders and developmental pediatric disorders. So diagnostic labs offering clinical diagnostic tests for these disorders need to be comfortable and able to accurately uh, uh, detect mutations in these disorders. Many of them are mosaic.
So, that, so this actually challenges the current paradigm for a lot of molecular diagnostic labs that study constitutional disorders. Because previously, again, for most Mendelian disorders, labs rely on what we call a constitutional paradigm, where you analyze or you test a single sample from the child, it's typically blood, and you, under the hypothesis or assumption that any mutation will be present in all of the cells of that child. And therefore, you utilize standard molecular techniques, so Sanger sequencing has been used for decades, for example, to diagnose these phenotypes. And the argument that's been held by the community for a very long time is that, well, many of these mosaic disorders have very clear physical characteristics. So uh, we can, we can you know, channel or target our testing strategy differently for those children. But what's, what NGS has also taught us increasingly, not only for these disorders, for, but for others, is that mosaicism is very much under-recognized. And it's much more widely prevalent. And here's an example of that from the same pathway. Mutations of PIK3R2 have been identified in a spectrum of kids who have very symmetric manifestations. They have a, a, a diffusely and symmetrically huge brain with bilateral cortical malformations shown in the, by the red arrows here. And most of the mutations we identified in the lab were constitutional. And therefore, we were counseling families that, yes, testing blood on your child is absolutely appropriate. These mutations are constitutional. This disorder is symmetric. It doesn't have patchy vascular malformations, no patchy uh, overgrowth, for example. However, when we utilized really deep next generation sequencing methods, here's what we found. So this graph is actually showing the mutation level in our uh, cohort of children with PIK3R2 mutations. So the x-axis is showing the individuals that were tested, and every bar is a sample. And these samples are color coded. So blood is in red, saliva is in light green, and the two buccal swab samples are in dark blue, and then we have a single skin sample that's shown in light blue over here. And the y-axis is showing you the level of the mutation as determined by the percentage of alleles that harbor that mutation. And what we see is that on the, on the I guess, your uh, left side of the chart, most of the children had constitu constitutional mutations, meaning that the level of the mutation was around 50%. But an important subgroup, which is on the right side of this graph, had really low level mosaic mutations. Many of these mutations would not be detectable by standard molecular methods, such as Sanger sequencing or standard depth NGS. So clinical diagnostic labs generally rely on a standard depth of 10 to 20x. This has been kind of accepted as appropriate depth. If it's lower than that, if it falls below that, then gap filling takes place, either through Sanger sequencing or through other methods. But many of these mutations, especially the really low-level mosaic mutations, would escape detection if we rely on these standard parameters. And this is really an important point. Again, this is a phenotypically you know, symmetrical disorder that can be an, uh, associated with constitutional mutation, but in a, in a good number of children is associated with mosaic variation. And, um, and here's actually an example of what these mutations would look like under a Sanger chromatogram, which is still heavily relied upon for single gene testing across different labs. While a constitutional mutation, this is actually present in 36% of alleles under the Sanger, uh, by Sanger imaging would appear, uh, can be reliably detected. Mutations that are, for example, really low, such as 11%, would essentially look like noise and they will escape detection. So labs really have to shift. Molecular diagnostic labs have to shift, shift their approach to a more mosaic approach. And this not only applies to rare cases such as PIK3R2. There's an ever-increasing number of uh, 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 reports of mosaic variation in epilepsy, intellectual disability, and autism. And I just want to highlight here through this uh, image that children with the mosaic PIK3R2 mutations looked indistinguishable from children with constitutional mutations shown in the top panel over here. They had equally symmetric variation. And even, uh, even to expand the story even further for you, we've also identified um, PIK3R2 mutations in two families where there were multiple affected siblings and parents tested negative, suggestive of gonadal uh, mosaicism. We've also identified another family shown over here where uh, the mother harbored the mutation and transmitted it in an autosomal dominant fashion to her affected children. So PIK3R2, in my uh, mind, exemplifies also the emerging paradigm for a lot of the genetic disorders. It can be inherited in a de novo fashion, which is most common and most common across genetic ideologies, but also in a dominant fashion, also in a mosaic fashion, and also in a gonadal mosaic fashion. So we need in our clinical diagnostic approaches to account for all of these and think for, about all of these, even if we technically cannot detect all of these sometimes. And again, as I mentioned, there has been a flurry of papers reporting mosaic variation in many, many genes coming from across the world, including clinical, increasingly by clinical diagnostic labs, and not just in focal disorders, you may argue, the PI3K AKT pathway, we should have a high level of suspicion, but really many other disorders, as I mentioned, many brain malformations, again, even epilepsy, intellectual disability, and, and such. So therefore, 
we have to be able to, as a clinical diagnostic uh, service, we have to be able to account for this phenomena. And one question is, is, well, what's the importance? What is the importance of detecting mosaicism and identifying mosaicism? Well, besides recurrence risk counseling, of course, there are really, really important and critical uh, uh, things that we will not understand otherwise if we don't understand the contribution of mosaicism, especially about the pathophysiology of the disease and, importantly, future therapeutic avenues. And I want to show you two updated research findings findings from this group of disorders that hopefully will highlight this. Because one of the most important goals for any clinical diagnostic service is to have a translational impact on a child's life. Our challenge and the goal is not ultimately just to diagnose a disorder, but really help to transform the child's life. And I'm hoping that this will be the case for some of these disorders. So when we think about these disorders, what determines the clinical phenotype? How do we how do we derive genotype-phenotype correlations? It's incredibly challenging. So there are two research kind of observations we have made over the past year that have helped us understand these disorders better. If we go back to PIK3CA, this is proving to be the most clinically variable uh, disorder or group of disorders in pediatrics to date. The sheer number of, of phenotypes that are associated with PIK3CA, as I mentioned, is staggering. And almost every week or two, there's a new paper reporting PIK3CA mutations in another phenotype. So how can mutations of the same gene be associated with such a wide spectrum of disorders? Well, one hypothesis, which is very, of course, intuitive, would be is that, well, it's the level of mosaicism. The fraction of cells that have the mutation will determine the severity of the phenotype. But our research uh, has shown that the uh, correlation is much more sophisticated than that. And it's not simply a function of the level of mosaicism. Because PIK3CA mutations are heavily reported in cancer. In fact, somatic mutations of PIK3CA are perhaps among the most common, commonly seen in, some, in, in data, cancer databases, such as the COSMIC database. When we look at the mutational spectrum of PIK3CA in cancer, shown here through the uh, green bars, and this is actually showing you the protein diagram of the gene with the functional domains, we, there's a very interesting observation, is that there are three cancer hotspot mutations shown by the red arrows that are incredibly common in PIK3CA and much more frequent seen thousands of times in PIK3CA cancer tissue rather, uh, that, rather than hundreds of times for everything, everything else. So the question is, what is the mutational spectrum of PIK3CA in pediatric disorders? Is it similar to cancer or not? And that question, I per perhaps don't need to emphasize to this audience, is incredibly crucial. If we want to utilize pathway inhibitor therapy that is utilized for cancer, if we want to even explore whether or not to use that, we need to understand the mutational spectrum in pediatric disorders as we do in cancer. And of course, Cancer, the cancer field is, is um, I think, much more advantaged than we are in that sense because the accessibility of tissue samples is much more uh, uh, established, whereas in pediatric disorders, um, it's, not, uh, it's not as much. So what we did actually is that we looked at PIK3CA-related uh, uh, phenotypes. We tried to ascertain, so over the past few years, we've been trying to ascertain as many tissue samples from these children as possible. And one of my main interests has been this disorder that's shown in this image over here. This is a disorder called MCAP. MCAP is perhaps the most symmetric disorder of all of the PIK3CA-related phenotypes, where kids are born with a large head size, vascular malformations, but their growth is not pervasive, unlike the other phenotypes. So these disorders that, for example, this one is shown over here, you can appreciate how severe this is. All of these disorders are characterized by pervasive degrees of overgrowth. And the brain phenotypes that are more focal are associated with much more severe epilepsy than MCAP, which is again symmetric. On the other hand, MCAP has a very high risk of neurosurgical complications. Kids with MCAP, unlike everybody else in this uh, graph, actually have a very high risk for hydrocephalus, high risk for Chiari's, and many of them undergo neurosurgery within the first two years of life. So the management of MCAP versus everything else diverges significantly. So one of the questions I always had is why is that? Why are these two groups perhaps so different? And so I have been studying MCAP for many years, and we were, uh, uh, thankfully, we've been able to collect samples from all over the world of kids who have this disorder. And again, this disorder is really critical because, because of the neurosurgical complications. Kids get surgery for hydrocephalus and Chiari, not brain epilepsy surgery, but there's a high risk of morbidity and mortality associated with it. And on the other hand, they don't have this pervasive overgrowth that occurs with other, with other conditions. So we really, the medical management just diverges significantly. So we can't really lump the PIK3CA-related disorders into one gigantic, under one gigantic umbrella. 
Clinically, that would be a very flawed approach. We would give confusing information to the family. We would follow imperfect treatment protocols. We just can't. So, so our, one of our goals was to see, does the mutational spectrum in PIK3CA differ, in, in MCAP differ from other PIK3CA related disorders? And is the tissue distribution different? So here's what we did. So over the past few years, we've been collecting, as I mentioned, many tissue samples. So this actually pie, uh, number of pie charts shows the number of tissue samples that we've collected. And they're also categorized by tissue type, with, with blood being in, uh, in red saliva in blue, uh, skin in orange, and other random, whatever you know, we were able to obtain, such as tonsillar tissue, teeth from uh, some of our uh, families, uh, shown in, in, in gray. We had a smaller group. So most of our children, of course, most of our research has been MCAP. We had a smaller group of kids who had somatic overgrowth without any other specific syndromic features. And then a, a small group of kids who had just brain overgrowth. No vascular or patchy malformations. So we utilized very deep next generation sequencing methods that I would be very happy to chat about after the talk if, you, if you're interested. And we really wanted to do as deep sequencing as possible. And we looked essentially at the level of the mutation across all of these tissue samples. So the x-axis here is showing the individuals tested. So these are just results from our most recent batch of 70 children. And the samples are color coded again by tissue type. And on the y-axis, which I apologize for the size of this graph, uh, shows the level of the mosaicism. So here's what we found. Generally, the level of mutations when we collapse and we uh, combine all tissue samples by type, level of, the level of mutation on average in blood was generally low. Which is, and it's actually tip, uh, tip, uh, lower typically than the Sanger detection level of stan standard whole exome sequencing of 20%, for example. And that's not surprising for mosaic disorders. Whereas in saliva, for example, or affected tissue, especially skin, the level of the mutation and mutations was generally higher. So that, that, this is you know, interesting, it's great. Saliva, what's, what was interesting for us uh, from uh, this experiment to see is to see that saliva may serve as a nice proxy for affected tissues. A lot of families do not opt for a skin biopsy. And uh, often, affected tissues are not accessible for, from, for these disorders. So this was interesting, but nonetheless, we felt like this didn't really provide the explanation for why these disorders differ, differ, and will molecular testing guide our clinical management or not. But here's a more interesting observation. When we look at the types of mutations that occur with PIK3CA in these disorders, here are the cancer-related mutations on the bottom half of this graph again. And when we look at the, all the mutations that have been identified in pediatric disorders that we generated and the community as a whole, so anybody that's published any PIK3CA uh, mutation in pediatric disorders, an interesting observation is clearly apparent, is that the mutational spectrum in pediatric disorders resembles that of cancer. The peaks are the same. So the hotspot mutations that, are, that occur in cancer are also hotspot hot spot mutations for pediatric disorders. But if we segregate now the mutations that occur in MCAP that are shown in blue versus the mutations of PIK3CA that occur in every other developmental phenotype, pediatric phenotype, that is shown in orange, the pattern segregates and diverges. As you can see, the mutations of PIK3CA that are associated with more focal, severe forms of body overgrowth are very similar to cancer with the shared hotspot mutations that are shown over here. This is the, these are the first two, and this is the other cancer hotspot mutations. As you can see, the orange and the uh, green peaks are similar. But with MCAP, the mutational spectrum is quite different. For one thing, it's much broader. It spans the entire gene, and it actually has a lower frequency, and in fact, none of the hotspot mutations. And this is really important. Um, and in fact, MCAP actually has different peaks altogether. And we believe that this truly explains the difference and has very important clinical translational implications. MCAP is a much more, as I mentioned, diffuse disorder. Children don't have this risk of pervasive overgrowth. And this probably explains, is explained by the fact that it's caused by less activating mutations within the gene, whereas other disorders are associated with more activating mutations. So naturally then, when designing a molecularly targeted uh, clinical trial, our approach should be different for MCAP versus these other, other disorders. The second observation that I'll make very quickly and then transition to talk about the megaplex is mTOR. When we did a simultaneous comparison between the molecular and the clinical data for mTOR, kids with mTOR mutations segregated into three clear groups. The first group of kids had focal cortical dysplasia, which as I mentioned again, is one of the most uh, uh, common causes of intractable epilepsy in children, so really has a high uh, health significance. And these children had mosaic mutations of mTOR that were only seen in brain tissue only, not seen at all in blood or saliva under deep sequencing. The second group of kids had 
diffuse brain overgrowth with bilateral cortical dysplasia had these very interesting mosaic streaks of the skin. And these kids had intermediate level mosaic mutations that were detectable in skin and also detectable in blood and saliva. But they were mosaic nonetheless. The third group of kids had diffuse brain overgrowth with no patchy manifestations. And some of them had autism looking like P10 which is very important for all of those P10 negative uh, children. And those kids had constitutional mutations that were present and detectable in blood and saliva. So for mTOR, it's, it's apparent that the phenotype is critically dependent on the level of mosaicism. And this is perhaps even further exemplified by this case. Well, this is a patient who actually was seen at Seattle Children's Hospital who had focal cortical dysplasia, underwent an extensive resection of this part here. And all the, the dots, by the way, are the points at which we were able to extract, successfully extract DNA from her brain tissue and sequence it for the mTOR mutation. And this is the mTOR mutation that was identified in her. And when we actually compared the mutation level across these brain regions, what we saw was that the mutation level was highest at 9% in the area that was most epileptogenic and most dysplastic by histopathology. The areas around it had lower level of mutation, uh, of the mutation, and the anterior edge of the lesion had no detectable mutation. So we actually saw for the first time a mutation gradient within, uh, within the brain. Here's another girl who had two surgical uh, epilepsy procedures because of intractable epilepsy. So she had the first surgery at five months, and then the second surgery, I'm sorry, the first surgery at seven months, second surgery at five years because her epilepsy recurred and it was intractable. And when we actually compared, and this is actually the first surgery, it's shown by the yellow boxes, the mutation level was highest in those samples uh, removed during that first procedure at 8%. And those brain regions were associated with much more significant epilepsy, as shown by the EEG here. And actually, we were able to demonstrate that pathway activity was highest in that region, as shown by uh, uh, Western blot for phospho S6, which is a marker of the pathway. The second surgical procedure, shown in blue boxes here, had a lower level of the mutation, decreased EEG activity, decreased level of pathway activation shown over here. So for the first time, what, is, you know, what, was, what was clearly apparent to us, what there was a correlation between the molecular aberrations with pathway dysregulation with clinical parameters such as EEG and degree of histopathology. And this really has important implications. So I hope what these examples have shown you is that clinical diagnostic labs that offer uh, uh, tests for Mendelian or genetic disorders are now in a place where they have to address and ta be able to tackle mosaicism as a phenomenon, because it is much more widely prevalent than, uh, uh, than previously thought. So, so, here's, uh, so this is where, of course, our teams kind of got together at Seattle Children's and the University of Washington. And it's been really a pleasure for me to work with such a phenomenal people of team, of, of, of pe a phenomenal a group of people. And we actually, in 2000, I believe it was 2014, if I'm not mistaken, that we collectively got together and developed the Megaplex panel, in addition to several other NGS panels, uh, as I mentioned, such as the Epiplex and Megaplex. It's a targeted panel, and we offered some of the genes that I talked about, P10, PIK3CA, AKT3, AKT1, and PIK3R2 using the Agile Insure Select uh, platform. Now, in order for us, understanding that we're dealing with, a, we're tackling a, a challenging group of disorders where mosaicism, again, is very common, we aimed for really deep next generation sequencing. So we've been, again, uh, uh, very happy to work with such a fantastic and technically uh, uh, excellent group of people. So our average coverage through our panel has been ranging from anywhere from 320 to more 1,000 uh, uh, sequencing reads per base pair, which is much higher than what standard panels offer. And this is really not only for us to be competitive, but also to offer the best service to the patients. And I, th I, feel, I feel like it really has paid off uh, for us. So, we've so, so far, we've sequenced 50 sam samples from 40 patients. Um, and we've been able to identify pathogenic mutations in nearly half of those patients, which I think is, a, is a, a, a quite a good hit rate. And I'll show you here some just very quick three examples of patients that we've analyzed in the lab just to show you a sample of our results and highlight some of our experience with these panels. So this is a girl who was saw, seen at Seattle Children's Hospital. She had a severe neurological picture right from birth. She had intractable epilepsy during, within the first few hours of life. She had very distinctive vascular malformations, and she had very severe and dysplastic uh, uh, single cerebral hemisphere, which is also called hemimegalencephaly. She was evaluated by Dr. Jeff Ogeman, who has been one of also the uh, really big supporters of our panels and our efforts, um, and underwent surgical resection for this brain tissue sample, uh, this brain region. On the uh, research side, 
and there, our research findings are shown in black over here. We analyzed, of course, as many brain tissue samples as we could, and we identified an AKT3 mutation in this girl. The level of the mutation ranged anywhere from 10 to 18%. And again, this would escape standard detection methods. So the family came back, of course, uh, to a clinic. And one of their main goals and priorities was to clinically confirm uh, this, uh, these research results. Because unfortunately, as a research laboratory, we cannot offer clinical, we do not offer clinical diagnostic testing. We are not a Kaplan CLIA certified laboratory. And so the family opted for uh, 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 clinical confirmation, not only to help establish the molecular diagnosis, but to widely disseminate this information by uh, adding, adding it to the child's medical record so it becomes really accessible to all of her care providers, and maybe in the future for therapeutic implications. And that's a, a, a distant goal for this child, perhaps, but uh, hopefully it won't be for other children, for example. So, uh, so we, we, the, a skin biopsy was performed in the clinic. Uh, and uh, specifically, the skin biopsy was performed on a region of affected uh, tissue. And our lab was able to uh, confirm this mutation. Here's our uh, uh, alternative allele fraction, 10 out of 789 reads. And even though that's a small number of reads, we're very comfortable with this result because it was clean, a clean sequence and our depth of coverage really allows us to be able to, uh, to quantify the level of mosaicism, even though it's only 1%. But again, we have very good uh, uh, deep coverage data. Here's another child that we saw also, uh, initially we were, uh, saw on the research side, who had a very unique picture. He had focal body uh, uh, overgrowth, as you can appreciate from his picture over here. He had facial overgrowth. Uh, interestingly, this child it was initially neurologically okay, but then subsequently started developing neurological deterioration. His MRI scan showed a Chiari malformation. So as shown over here in the, by the red arrow, and sorry for the low resolution of the MRI scan, but really a gigantic Chiari malformation. And uh, on the research side, we also had several tissue samples from this child, and we have we identified a PIK3CA mutation on him that's shown over here that was nearly undetectable in blood. And there it is right, right here, less than 1%. I mean, this is incredibly, of course, technically challenging to, to detect, but ranged anywhere from about uh, 5 to 15, 17% in affected skin. The family also, for the same reasons, wanted clinical diagnostic confirmation. So samples from both, paired samples from both blood and uh, skin were sent to the clinical diagnostic lab, and we were able to accurately uh, detect and confirm the mutation. And our depth of coverage was quite excellent, as you can appreciate, 1,000, more than 1,000 reads, for example, for one of these one of these samples. So this was really uh, great and encouraging. Here's the last example that I'll mention to you. This is actually a young man that we saw at Seattle Children's. It's, it was a heartbreaking story in a way because this boy was born with a, a massively enlarged head size. He had uh, vascular malformations that are shown on his arms. Uh, so he looked like MCAP. Uh, uh, but hasn't been well, it wasn't diagnosed for many many years. He actually came in because he was developing other uh, systemic symptoms and developed a B cell, a large B cell lymphoma. And after the lymphoma, he actually suffered a really uh, protracted course because he had recurrent pleural and pericardial effusions with suspected lymphatic malformations, which we now know can be associated with, with PIK3CA. And so really had a horrible course here at, at, uh, at Seattle's Children's, but thankfully has now is improved and is in remission. So not only did we can, you know, did, did a lot of our samples were the confirmation of research results, but we've also offered most of our samples were actually diagnosis uh, brand new for patients who are uh, being seen, and uh, the, he's one of them. So we actually were able to detect in the clinical diagnostic lab a PIK3CA mutation on him that was present in more than 50% of alleles in his skin, but was much, uh, much lower level at 2% in his blood. And again, interestingly, he's one of those few cases of MCAP that have actually developed cancer. So we're in the process of actually uh, trying to sequence uh, genomic DNA extracted from his lymphoma and compare that sequence to his peripheral uh, uh, genomic DNA as well to see perhaps if there is any shared variation there to explain his features. So, so these are just some brief examples of some of the interesting cases we've seen through the Megaplex uh, panel. Um, and I think that uh, uh, our lab has been uh, really, uh, we've learned a lot through the process. And it's really been not only um, uh, just fun to work with such an excellent group of people, but it's really been, I feel, helpful to the families who've expressed uh, a lot of positive experience, I think, with us. But where do we go from here? What, what's, what's the ultimate goal? And what, what, what do we do next? So the first thing we want to do is actually uh, recognizing, again, that next generation sequencing is becoming much more widely available. Exome sequencing is rapidly wiping out the, the, the uh, field of panel testing. We still think that for a lot of these disorders, especially when they're mosaic, panel testing that allows ultra deep sequencing is the most ideal clinical approach. So what we're actually going to be doing next is that we have a, an updated version of the Megaplex uh, 
uh, panel that hopefully will go live soon that includes a much larger number of genes that I've highlighted over here. These are all genes that overlap with, uh, with each other. So we believe that this panel would be uh, very good for a lot of our uh, patients. And uh, in order to be competitive again, not only is it inclusive of more genes, again, our technology is robust that allows us to detect, detect and quantify low-level mosaicism. So we hope that uh, uh, this panel will uh, uh, be uh, um, helpful. And importantly, I mean, the, the main reason why, why we've developed it is that we think it will be helpful to patients and families um, and providers. So this is the first avenue, is to optimize and uh, our molecular diagnostic approach. But at the same time, the clinical translational component is very exciting for these disorders. And this has been actually one of the main motivators for us to, to, uh, uh, to embark on this journey. Many of these disorders are targetable. So the PI3K AKT pathway has been heavily targeted by the cancer world for uh, treatment. So there are several inhibitors that are shown here. There are single inhibitors and dual inhibitors of multiple arms within the pathway that are available for various cancer uh, disorders. Importantly, tuberous sclerosis, of course, mTOR inhibi inhibitors are, have been available now for many years for many of the um, manifestations of tuberous sclerosis. So we know that this, uh, this is a, a potential area that we can work on. And there are several, and there are many preclinical trials, by the way, that I just kind of listed a summary over here of preclinical animal trials with various inhibitors. Many of these have very good uh, uh, CNS penetration. So, and to show you just very brief, again, research updates and encouraging stories, is that in our mTOR uh, uh, cohort, what we did was in utero electroporation of mutant constructs into rat neurons, and using RAD001, which is kind of an Everlimus uh, analog, which is an, a specific mTOR inhibitor, we were able to demonstrate that the neuronal pathology in these neurons actually decreases. The size of the neurons decreases, and that actually is very promising. And many, many other studies have replicated similar findings in animal models as well. At the Seattle Children's Research Institute, we have a PIK3CA gain of function mouse model that we have treated with BKM120. BKM120 is a specific PI3K inhibitor, as shown over here, that has very good CNS penetration. And what we were, what we were able to show is that the frequency of seizures decreases significantly in children who are treated with BKM, I'm sorry, in mice treated with BKM120 versus wild type. And again, BK, and actually BKM120 is on its way to becoming FDA approved. It has very good CNS penetration. Now, so this is all very promising, of course. There are many challenges that remain uh, uh, and many things that we need to tackle as a research community, including the safety, the efficacy of these, disorder, uh, of these um, uh, uh, inhibitors. But the first you know, usually the first key to be able to even tackle the question of therapies is to be able to accurately detect the genetic variation. And one of the, my favorite quotes uh, comes actually from Les Biesecker, who works on these disorders, is that he says that for the first time, we are, in genetics are actually in a, a position of power when it comes to uh, uh, clinical trials for these disorders. Because many of the dr uh, uh, drug companies that offer inhibitors for these, uh, for these are typically uh, uh, offering them for cancer. And cancer patients and the d degree of genetic aberrations that occur in cancer are incredibly complex. Most can cancer tissues have many, many, many genetic aberrations. Whereas here, we, we have a population of children who have a growing population of children who have mosaic variation within these genes, but in a single gene at a time. So theoretically, tackling the pathway aberration that occurs secondary to these mutations should be uh, easier. The challenge, of course, is our goal is to not kill the cells that have the mutations, unlike cancer. We, our goal is to actually normalize signaling, which is a much more challenging uh, 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 you know, task. But I, I'm, I'm hopeful we'll get there. And really, the first key for all of these, again, is clinical diagnostic testing. So I think that uh, so, so together, I mean, honestly, through the Megaplex, we've been able to attract a really good population of patients and families. And it has mutually benefited the research and the clinical uh, sides as well. So I'll end with that. And I thank you for your attention. I'm sorry if I went over time. Um, actually, I think uh, I'm right on time, perhaps. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, uh, and I'll really thank the teams. Uh, the people that I've been directly interacting with are listed over here. But there are many people behind the scenes that have been working very hard uh, and are truly excellent that have been working on these disorders. And it's been really fun to actually interact with both the research and the clinical teams, both at Seattle Children's and the University of Washington. Thanks for your attention. And I welcome any questions or comments. Now that we have these very sensitive techniques, how frequent is mosaicism in the normal population? Now that we have these very sensitive, uh, I'll, I'll repeat my, my question. Now that we have these very sensitive techniques, how frequent
Yeah, so that's a that's a very uh, good question. It is definitely under recognized. So you know, when it comes to Mendelian disorders, so in individuals who have uh, a Mendelian disorder, who have a disorder of some sort, it was always estimated, or uh, uh, I think a large scale series have estimated that 15 to 20 percent of mutations can be mosaic for these disorders. Now, when we talk about normal populations, it's a much more uh, challenging question to answer because of the fact that we don't systematically look for mosaic variation in these individuals. There has been recently actually a number of really, really good papers that came out that I would be happy to, to share with you that have actually been looking at uh, parental mosaicism, not only for uh, uh, SNVs or single nucleotide variation, but also for copy number variation. And it was looking basically at parents of affected children to look at the risk of, of uh, parental undetected parental mosaicism and uh, uh, mosaicism in normal individuals. And it's, uh, the data is actually showing uh, that it is more common than we previously thought. There isn't a, a specific figure that I'm aware of yet, um, but it's definitely prevalent, much more prevalent than we thought, absolutely. And one of the big questions we actually are faced with a lot of, a lot of the time is for mosaic, for example, PIK3C mutations or mTOR is, well, how often do we see these mutations in normal? individuals? Can we see them in normal individuals? And this is actually a, pro, uh, a, a special interest of ours. And many of my colleagues actually have been, there's a special colleague of mine who I don't know, is, I don't think Jimmy's here, who has been uh, aiming to tackle this fundamental question about the rate of mosaicism in, in, uh, in nor, under normal circumstances by doing fetal uh, sequencing. Hey, Colin. Right. Excellent, excellent talk. This is amazing. I'm obviously on the seat of my on the edge of my seat this whole time. So um, a, a couple of questions. I have many questions, and I'll ask you afterwards, because sure. obviously I love the work you're doing. But sure. the, first, the first question is kind of from a philosophical standpoint. You know, you showed some kids with very, very focal syndromes, like the kid with the, just the two fingers and an activating PIK3CA mutation. So my philosophical question is, when, when does a mutation become a syndrome versus just <laughs> you know, a somatic mutation in a lesion yeah. that's not a syndrome? You know, yeah. where, where do we draw that line, or is there a line? That's an excellent question, uh, Colin. And to be honest with you, I tend to be, I'm not a, a you know, it's a, a splitter, I feel like sometimes it's a splitter versus a lumper kind of, you know, argument that I, sometimes we, we, get, we get into when we talk about that, because the, the community, essentially, we, we, it's a continuum. This is how, I, like most of the people who work on PIK3CA, we now recognize that it's a continuum, that you can have a mosaic mutation in a finger, and you can have it all over the body, those two disorders are not the same. And the way you're managing those children is not the same. And the way you even importantly treat those patients is not the same. So uh, actually, a, a group uh, that was been working on PIK3CA proposed that we call all of these PIK3CA-related overgrowth syndromes, PROs. And many of the people in the community objected to that. Because again, you're giving the same diagnosis to a child who has finger overgrowth, as, as well as a child with a multi-system severe clinical picture. And I mean, I'm sure that would be devastating to, not only confusing, but devastating to some, to some families. I think, Colin, honestly, that it is a continuum, that it really depends on the fraction of cells that have the mutation. And we will see everywhere, you know, we'll see every, every point along that spectrum eventually when we have screened enough kids and we've assayed enough tissues. So I, I don't have a good answer for that. I think your point is absolutely, I mean, right on because it is, it's, it's not the same disorders. When do we label something a syndrome and when we don't? I think mosaicism kind of blurs all of those boundaries and challenges those very traditional syndromic designations. So I don't think it really is the correct thing to do is to attach these very specific labels. So, sure. yeah. So, they, so, so second question, hopefully quicker. So regarding treatment, so it's really exciting. We have all these PI3 kinase inhibitors, we have mTOR inhibitors, we have AKT inhibitors that we use in cancer. Yeah. But you made a really excellent point that I hadn't thought about until you said it, is that you're tr not trying to kill the cells in mm -hmm. these kids. And so do you know, are there early, you mentioned preclinical trials, are there early like phase one trials going on? And if so, if they're using the same drugs, are they using them at, at different uh, doses per kilogram? Or, or how is that being approached? Yeah, so of course, besides the ongoing work with tuberous sclerosis, of course, with several clinical trials and, and preclinical trials, I think, for using uh, uh, rapamycin for tuberous sclerosis. So that's, I think, separate from anything I will, I will say. Um, there have been several clinical trials, including one with sirolimus, for vascular malformations uh, that are caused by PIK3CA mutations. Uh, this was an NIH, of course, clinical trial that was just recently closed, and I were ex expecting, hopefully, to hear results sometime soon. So everolimus and sirolimus have been, uh, uh, I think there's a, a lot of groups that have, are working on uh, 
uh, and doing clinical trials for those disorders. The problem is, is that those disorders, of course, as with any medication, they have side effects. They don't have the most ideal CNS penetration. So when we talk about some of the pcrca related disorders, a lot of the time, what is the, you know, the, the question comes down to is what is the, the, the end point? What is the therapeutic target that we want to actually uh, uh, focus on? So for a lot of disorders that have brain development, uh, you know, abnormal brain development, this starts very early on in utero. So this would be quite challenging, I think, to treat. And we'd have to select specific inhibitors, and some are available that have very good blood-brain barrier penetration. And there are ones that are available, but they're much earlier in the pipeline than the ones that are clinically currently available. So I think there's a lot of work happening. So we're, we were very excited with the BKM 120 study that was done at Seattle Children's Research Institute. Um, but again, this is one agent that's available. So, um, so there are several others. But to be honest with you, Colin, what, I, what we do know is that we need a clear partnership with um, with pharmaceutical companies in order to fuel, fuel this research. Um, but what I really find satisfying, to be honest with you, about working, is that, uh, working in this field is that, again, we hold the first step. You know, by the, the first thing is really to accurately detect these mutations. So I, I do feel that this is the most critical and instrumental step uh, that signifies the work we're doing here. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Regarding the PIP3 pa uh, pathway involved in many cancers, including ovarian, as far as I know, in breast cancer, yeah. are there any case reports of families who have the cancer in these pathways, and as well as children who are involved, who are affected with these, you know, like hemi? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, so there are, um, so, so not to my knowledge, but um, of the children who have MCAP, uh, actually, I'm sorry, uh, children who have other PIK3CA-related disorders, there have been several uh, reports uh, of patients who've had Wilms tumor, which is why we screen all of our kids for Wilms tumor, even though we don't have robust statistical data. Um, and the genetic landscape of Wilms tumor, of course, is complex, and it's not especially the PIK3CA-related tumors is, 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 as you accurately noted, PIK, uh, breast cancer has a, a higher uh, incidence of PIK3CA mutations. But there has only been these cases of Wilms tumor that have occurred in children who have mosaic PIK3CA uh, pediatric disorders. Uh, so this is currently the state of uh, information. So, and I, we're, we, one of our actually goals is to actually do long-term natural history studies to really assess the risk of cancer in these disorders. Is it as high as P10? Uh, we don't know yet. We don't know. Most of our children are still in the pediatric age range, and we have uh, uh, poor, I think, longitudinal data collection at this point in time, unfortunately. And I was kind of trying to understand whether the mosaicism in the parents, like the mother or the father. Oh, could... increased risk of cancer in, yeah, the, in them. Yeah, in them. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, and again, and most of the, our cases have been mosaic, meaning that the mutation arose uh, during early fetal development and was not inherited from a, an affected parent in most of these. So uh, I would presume that mo so most of the time, the parents were clinically and molecularly unaffected in, in, in the PIK3CA-related disorders so far. And so in your far. cohort, do you have the parents also tested as well. Yeah. So yeah. as to the, to, sometimes it's an overkill, to be honest with you, especially with scarce research funds. But we sequence the parents all the time. So with PIK3R2, actually, because we had two families that had multiple siblings that were affected, we now screen the parents as much as possible, as deep as possible, mm -hmm. to try to, to, to get down at uh, understanding the gonadal mosaicism risk. And it is from but we haven't detected yeah. anything in the parents yet, even at deep sequencing in those two families, at least. So yeah. So, and that's another actually really important point is that again, for diagnostic testing, there are several studies, not by our group actually, to come back to your point, that have shown that parental mosaicism is actually more common for many of the Mendelian disorders. So, and a lot of the time, again, parents are usually tested using standard approaches, using blood, for example, and things like that. And that may be a flawed approach. I think also gonadal mosaicism will be much more widely appreciated with NGS than we previously thought too, so. No, if no other questions, well, thanks a lot. Thanks everyone.